A very good evening to you all. So we come into the fourth part of our series, and the title for tonight's message is simply Spiritual Gifts. So for those of you who haven't been here, first week we looked at taking the gospel seriously. The need for us as believers to take the gospel seriously if we wish to be the authentic church. We then had John Balz share with us about the gospel and how, if we truly understand how lost we were, how lost we are without Christ, as well as how great a love He shows us to save us. Um, when we truly understand that, we'll start becoming the authentic church. Darren shared with us last week about how we need to be in fellowship with God, in fellowship with one another, and through that, living um, as a community, and not just taking fellowship as an event, but as a lifestyle. And as we come into our fourth part of the Authentic Church series, and I'm sure you're all wondering what, what are these things doing on stage, I would like to suggest to you all tonight that this is what the church looks like. This is what the contemporary church is looking like today. It's far from the authentic church, and my reasoning for that would be the lack of spiritual gifts and the lack of people actually using their spiritual gifts. There's a lack of people actively using their spiritual gifts to edify the church. And this is what the church is looking like. We're not one body. We're just pieces all over the place. What I mean by this is that we attend a Sunday meeting. We sit in our chairs and we, we watch a few people lead us in worship. We then watch the, the pastor. Okay, I don't want to say watch people worship. We worship with them. We then sit down and we listen to the pastor preach a sermon as he uses his spiritual gift. We then go, we grab a cup of tea and go home. Where in that process are we using our spiritual gifts? If we call that church, which the world is calling that church, how are we using our spiritual gifts by attending a Sunday meeting, worshiping, listening to a sermon, and going home? We are failing to be the church, and we are failing to use our spiritual gifts if that's what church looks like. And I say we are failing because it is impossible for every believer to use their spiritual gift if that's what church is. For example, I would suggest right now, I'm the only one using my spiritual gift. And I'm not trying to boast myself up. This morning I was at church, I didn't use a spiritual gift. Someone needs to be discipled, that's the pastor's job. Someone needs counseling, that's the pastor's job. Someone needs healing, that's the pastor's job. And if the pastor fails, send him to Dr. Gunning. <laughs> if Dr. Gunning fails, then oh, we better hope we find a healer in the church. Someone needs to be cared for, that's the pastor's job. Someone needs encouragement, speak to the pastor. Hey, after all, he gets a salary from this church. It would seem that the pastor is the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the miracle worker, the healer, the helper, the administrator. He seems to be everything. He seems to have all the spiritual gifts. Well, I think that's at least what the church expects of him. And we may, we may think, mm, I don't expect that from him. But by us not using our spiritual gifts, someone's got to. Someone's got to cover up for where we're not doing our job. And as we go through the topic of spiritual gifts this evening, I want the focus to be this. We fail to be the church if we aren't all, all of us, using our spiritual gifts. I don't know if that's English. But we fail to be the church if we aren't all using our spiritual gifts. If there are believers in BBC and the church of Zimbabwe not using their spiritual gifts, 
then we fail to be the authentic, real deal church. We will never be able to build the church. We will never be able to serve others, edify one another, and we will never be able to be united if we are not using our spiritual gifts. And tonight, in order to try to understand spiritual gifts a little bit better and why we need to be using them and what they are, we're going to use Paul's letter to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And at the end of tonight, I want us to be able to answer four questions. And they're probably very simple questions that when I say them, you'll be able to give me an answer. But I think the problem is a lot of people have the knowledge, they have the head knowledge of what spiritual gifts are, what we've got to do with them. But unfortunately, we're not doing it. So as, as I ask these questions and as you start trying to answer it in your head, ask yourself, is this just head knowledge? Or is, is the, what the answer is meant to be, is it evident in my life? So by the end of tonight, I want us to answer these four questions. What is a spiritual gift? Where do we get our spiritual gifts from? What are spiritual gifts for? And how do I know what spiritual gift I have? What is a spiritual gift? Where do we get them from? What are they for? And how do I know what gift I have? So please, I'm not here to answer debates about sensationism versus continuism. And in English words, because I had to so I try to be smart. I'm not trying to give my opinion on whether spiritual gifts, there are certain spiritual gifts that's, that seized at the apostolic age, at the end of it. I'm not trying to say whether the gift of tongues is here or not. I'm not trying to debate about that. And I think the problem is, the moment we speak about spiritual gifts, everyone thinks, oh, tongues, oh, prophecy. Oh, and they, we just start thinking about all these things. I'm here tonight to focus on how we as believers need to be using our spiritual gifts if we wish to be the authentic church. I'm not here to tell you which gifts exist and which don't. I'm not here to share my opinion, but what I am here, what I'm here to do tonight is try and encourage us to realize we need to be using our spiritual gifts in order to be the authentic church. So before we get digging into Scripture, what is a spiritual gift? There's a lot more wise people out in the audience. I'm going to let you guys answer first. What do we think a spiritual gift is? A talent? A God-given talent? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Something we do to serve, yes. That's good. One more. Yeah. Something that we wouldn't naturally have, indeed. And I think on that, I think most of you who would have been at church the time I stood up to share a report about AFJ and I couldn't get the word Mabuku out. Um, and I, I, am, I am so terrified when it comes to public speaking. At school, I would never stand up and speak in, in front of every, anyone. Um, to say a prayer at, at school, I, oh, anything to do with standing up and speaking in front of people. And for those of you who don't know, I, I got up in the morning service to share a little bit of a report. And I was trying to share about AFJ and how we go to the hospitals and we go to um, the orphanages in Mabuku. I could say it. And uh, I got to the word Mabuku. And when I get nervous, I stutter badly and I couldn't get the word out. But the thing that blows my mind, and this is completely off track, but it's what Google said, is it's not something we're normally good at. Um, The first time I ever preached God's word, I was terrified. I was like, I'm going to stutter the whole way through this. So nervous. As soon as I stood up there, finished in my opening prayer, nerves were gone, and God just takes over. A bit of a sidetrack, but what is a gift? Firstly, we need to understand that this is not a talent or an ability that we have before the Holy Spirit comes into our life. I cannot be spiritually gifted at rugby. I cannot be spiritually gifted at singing. I cannot be spiritually gifted at being a businessman, whatever. 
We can't, we can't think spiritual gifts are talents or abilities that we have, whether the Holy Spirit is in us or not. Unbelievers have talents and abilities. A spiritual gift, yes, it can be a talent, a God-given talent to you, but a God-given gift that enables us to serve and edify the church. Exactly what Kerry said is what I would say. A spiritual gift is something, a God-given gift, that enables us to serve and edify one another more effectively. Basically, a God-given gift that enables us to be the authentic church. So I hope you all understand what a, a, a spiritual gift is, and I'm sure you all knew before I even had to explain it. But another important aspect to understand is the second question. Where do we get our spiritual gift from? 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. Verse 7 as well. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. We receive our spiritual gifts from God, from the Holy Spirit. I cannot give myself a spiritual gift. I cannot decide I want these gifts. The Holy Spirit gives us a gift as He wills. End of verse 11. Not by my will, not what I want, but as the Holy Spirit wills. And six times in verse 1 to 11, Paul emphasizes on the fact that gifts, although they may be different, all come from the same source. In verse 4, we see there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are many gifts, but it all comes from one Spirit and through one Spirit. And then the second, the fourth, the fifth, the, fifth, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth time that Paul places emphasis about the source comes from verse 8 through to 11. And he reads this, verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the inter interpretation of tongues. And we come to verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So Paul goes on and he lists, he gives the examples of what he means by diversities of gifts from, form, from verse 4. Gift, word of wisdom, through the Holy Spirit. Word of knowledge, through the same Spirit. Faith, a quick one, he's not talking about saving faith. He's not talking about the faith we have when we are saved. What he's talking about and what I think, and, John, and I got this from John, John MacArthur, he suggests that the gift of faith is exercised in persistent prayer and endurance in intercession, along with a strong trust in God in the midst of difficult circumstances. Again, this is a gift given by the same Spirit. And he goes on to list a few more gifts, and then he finishes in verse 11. And he says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. What's so important about that? Well, of course we're all under the same Spirit. I would like to suggest that if we truly understand and we truly believe that this is a gift from God, we will want to use it. I believe that when we truly understand that this is a precious, a powerful and a massive blessing that God has given us, we're going to want to grab it and we're going to want to use it. Someone gives you a gift, you're not just going to leave it there, unwrap it, see it. Nah, I don't want it and just leave it there. Yeah, maybe if it's not a nice gift, you will. But this is the best gift you can ever get. It's a gift that is going to grow you. It's a gift that's going to make you a better person. And if we truly understand how blessed we are to have a spiritual gift from God, a special gift just for you from God, when we truly believe that and understand that, I'd like to suggest we will want to cling on to that and use that gift as much as we can.
But the focus tonight and the main question I want answered is this. What are our spiritual gifts for? And this is what I really want us to focus on because as I said earlier, we fail to be the church if we aren't all using our spiritual gifts. And when we understand what they are for, I'd like to think we're going to want to use our gifts a bit more. And it's here where I'll start, you might start to understand why I, I'm suggesting that this is what the church looks like. Why the church is in pieces, it's not one body. And I'm going to use verse 12 through to 24 to explain this. So I'm going to quickly read, read through it. Follow me if you have your Bible. Verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, where the Jews or Greeks, where the slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. For if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, am I, am I not of the body? Is, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole, if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor and unpre unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having gr given greater honor to the part which lacks it. So Paul in these verses, as I'm sure you, you saw, is using the human body as an analogy to show the unity needed in the church. And it's important to understand that that unity is only made possible through Christ. He speaks about how in verse 14, although the human body has many members, has hands, fingers, arms, legs, he has many members, it is indeed one body. And this is how the body of Christ, the church, should be. Despite the fact that there are many of us, despite the fact that there are many gifts, despite the fact that there are many members in the church body, we need to be one body made up of many members. But as I look at the church today, I see many members, but not a body. Put it into understanding of church. Let's take the body as the church of Zimbabwe. Members as various churches. We're not united. We stick to ourselves. We just focus here. Yeah. We don't really... Yeah, now and again we might pray that they're doing well, but... We don't really care about how successful they are, how many lives have been saved through other churches. It's almost like a competition. To prove his points about how we need to be one body, he uses, I'd say, very simple grade 3 language. Verse 15, if the, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, am I not the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole, if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? What Paul is trying to say is, the foot is no less or no more of a body than the hand. They all have a very significant role in order to make up the body. And what he's saying is, you are no less or no more crucial to making up the body, the church body. Whether you think you're just a finger, or whether you think you're a whole leg, you are important to making up the body. You are no different, whether you're a hand or a foot, to making up the body. 
And if you as the hand are not doing your duty by using your spiritual gift, you are preventing the church body from being one body. Paul also deals with a problem that was evident in the church of Corinth and that people were discontent with their gifts. And I think that's why he's trying to say a hand is important, a foot is important. You may look at your gift and you may say, oh, it's so in- in- insignificant. I'm-, I'm just like a finger. Where is this gift? Like, you're almost the whole body. I want to be this gift. And Paul's saying, they're all the same. They're all as important as each other. And I, I'm not sure if it's a problem, but I would like to think not. I don't know if people are discontent with their gifts in churches today. I think, I think we may be. Oh, but God, I, hey, I, I want to I do this gift. Like, people are going to see me more. I'm going to be able to do more. I'm be, maybe I'm going to be, like, people are going to be a little bit more wowed by what I do if you give me this gift. Like, this is a, like behind the scenes sort of stuff. God, I want to be out there. But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as He pleased. We've got to be happy and we've got to be content with the gift God has given us. Because it's His will, not our will. And another thing I, I think might be a problem, and we, because I'm a hand, we feel like we're not significant enough. Our gift or our role in the church isn't good enough. The ministry I run isn't good enough. It's not as big as this one. And when people start saying, oh, I'm just a hand. I'm not really significant. I'm not important to this church. I mean, hey, I do something, but if I wasn't doing it, it would probably be fine. And that's why we end up with a church like this. Because people are either not content or they think their gift is not good enough. God has given you a gift. I promise you it's good enough. The church is looking like a church just made up of a chest, some abs, a stomach, a head. It is essential that we look at every single gift as very, very important. Verse 20 through to 24. But now indeed there are many members yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. The eye needs the hand. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor and are un presentable parts have greater modesty. We cannot be putting our pastor on a pedestal and then viewing the people that pray behind the scenes as less important. And I think we as a church are very blessed to have a pastor that genuinely believes that there is no hierarchy at this church. We are very blessed to have a pastor that will not just say it, but he believes it, that he is not at the top. And that's what we need to understand as well. You, you may think you're down at the bottom, but you are no greater or you are no less significant than the pastor or the elders. You have a very, very important role. And when we understand that our role is essential for the church body to be edified and to be united, I truly believe we'll start using our gifts a little bit more. You can have the best pastor and the best worship leader in the world. But if the church body is not doing their job, numbers aren't going to grow. You can have the best pastor in the world. Thousands of people love this guy. But if the church body are not using their spiritual gift and being the member, then it's not an authentic church. It's not going to grow. It's not going to be edified. And you're probably sitting there thinking, hang on, you asked the question of what are spiritual gifts for and now you're going on a whole nother rant. But as believers, 
When we become members of the body, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we get a spiritual gift. When the Holy Spirit comes into us, we receive a spiritual gift. We cannot be a member of, of a body without a spiritual gift. And I cannot do a ministry or an activity in the church without a spiritual gift. I cannot do a ministry that's going to glorify God if I'm not using my spiritual gift. Therefore, I need to use my spiritual gift to do a ministry that is going to unify, that is going to edify, and is going to make the church a better church. Therefore, I would suggest that one answer for the need of spiritual gifts is to unify the church. Using our spiritual gifts to do various ministries and making the church one. No matter how insignificant you think your ministry is, it is essential. Use your spiritual gift for a ministry and unify the body. And when we are using our spiritual gifts to do various ministries, now we're getting the hands connected to the, the shoulder. We're getting the hands connected to the arm, the arm to the shoulder, the legs to the waist, and this guy's going to look like a normal human. I'm not going to build it because it's quite complicated. But When we start using our spiritual gifts to edify and unify the body, we're going to start having a normal looking body and a normal, authentic church that God desires us to be. If we are just by, if we think we can just attend a Sunday service and go to a Bible study on a Wednesday, I'm sorry, but you're not using your spiritual gifts like that. We can't be the authentic church by just going to a Sunday service for two hours and then going to a Bible study and think, I'm doing church. If you're not using your spiritual gifts, how are you unifying the body? So my question to us all is, as we look at the authentic church and the need for spiritual gift to unify the church is this. Are you, by not using your spiritual gift, preventing the church from being the authentic church? Are you, by not using a spiritual gift, preventing the church from reaching its best potential? Or are you using your gift, serving others, and unifying the church? Again, I'll ask you, are you preventing the church from being a united body? Or are you using your gift, serving others, and uniting the body. Another answer to what spiritual gifts are for is answered at the end of verse 7. That the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Our gifts should be spiritually profiting all who receive our ministry. When I use my spiritual gift, I should be profiting others. I should be building up Others, I should be edifying the other believers that I'm interacting with, that are affected by my ministry that I'm doing through my spiritual gift. Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. He's given us spiritual gifts for the equipping of saints. He will equip us. When He gives us a spiritual gift, <coughs> He's going to equip us. For what? For the work of ministry. He's going to equip us for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. God has given you a spiritual gift to equip you to get involved in a ministry and do something for God so that you can edify the church. Edify the body of Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12, Paul says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. You can be so excited to have a spiritual gift. You can be super pumped for a spiritual gift. But if it's not for the edification of the church, you're wasting time. And I think there's too many people seeking spiritual gifts for their own benefit and not for the edification of the church. We need to be zealous for spiritual gifts and let that zealous, 
spirit be for the edification of the church. Once again, we need to ask ourselves, are we edifying the church? Are we using our spiritual gifts and edifying the church? Because if we're just attending a Sunday service and attending a Bible study in the week, we're not using the gifts God has given us to its full potential. And we're not really edifying the church the way we should be. So a challenge for you and a challenge for me. Are we edifying the church? Are we using our spiritual gifts and are we serving others? Because if we are not using our spiritual gifts, we are failing to be the authentic church. Church, we need to get the idea of coming to, to church on a Sunday to be served out of our heads. We need to get the idea of coming to Sunday for worship and a sermon and going home and think we're doing church. We've got to get that idea out of our heads. We need to be giving more than serving. We need to get that idea of coming to church and listen to a sermon and then going home out of our heads. We need to be coming to church to give, not just to receive. We can't rely on one man to just give. We need to start being the authentic church where all believers are using their spiritual gift every day, not just on a Sunday. We need to be using our spiritual gifts every day. So again, I ask you, what are you doing to edify and unite the church? And if your answer is, I'm not sure what I'm doing, or I'm not doing anything, we need to do something. We need to respond to the fact that we are not doing anything or we're not sure about that. And hopefully if you're like me, you've got to the stage and you realize you're either not using your spiritual gifts the way you should be to edify the church, or you actually are using your gift. And if you are using your gift, carry on. Use it more. Don't stop. But if you're not using your gift, I encourage you to start using it. Or maybe you're thinking, well, I want to use my spiritual gift, but I don't know what it is. How do I know what my spiritual gift is? Should I go online? Should I take an online test? Google spiritual gift test. Answer these 40 questions. How often do you pray in a day? And you're thinking, oh, probably like 10 minutes, but I know I should do an hour, so you're going to take an hour. And you've got all these questions. And if you're honest, you're probably not answering correctly. So I recommend, maybe don't go that route. It's not, you can try, but it's not recommended. It's not the best idea, because I feel like we might just throw in a little bit of exaggeration to make ourselves look better. Do you Google how many spiritual gifts are there, or what are the spiritual gifts, and then print the list and tick what you want, or tick what you think you should do, and tick what, tick what you think God is going to use you best for? No, don't do that. And I got some uh, knowledge from a young man, Pastor John Bell, and he says, we are told to serve one another in the Bible. There are, I think it's like 50 something one another's in the New Testament. And what are gifts for? To edify and to serve others. You want to know what your gift is? Serve. Serve people. Don't, don't worry about knowing what your gift is before you start serving. Serve, and through your serving, you'll start identifying what gift God has given you. Maybe you'll go and you'll start serving people and you're seeing that you're helping people. You see that you're constantly encouraging people. You're teaching people. You're sharing words of wisdom. Various things. Serve, and then you'll identify what your gift is. Maybe if you have the gift of encouragement, start serving and you'll see people are constantly coming to you and you're encouraging them. People are coming to you and they, they're down, they need help, and you, you're there to encourage them and help them. And another way to maybe know what your spiritual gift is, is you'll be passionate about it. You'll be excited about it. If your gift, of, of, if your gift, gift 
is, our, is encouragement. <coughs> Let me start again. If your gift is encouragement, you're going to be passionate and you're going to be excited about encouraging people. You're going to take so much joy away from the fact that you have, enab- you have been able to encourage someone. But you're not going to be excited to stand up and preach God's word or teach someone because that's not your gift. Let's not force ourselves to do gifts that we don't truly have. Serve. Find out what your gift is. It's probably something you're going to be passionate about. It's probably something you're going to be doing that you don't even think is your gift. And use it to edify and unify the body. And one more thing. Please understand this. You cannot have all the gifts. We see in verse 29 to 30, Paul asking rhetorical questions to them and he's expecting no answer after every question. So I'll put in that no. And he says in verse 29, Are all all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak? Oh, hey, hey, when do you relax? Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. If the answer to those are no, why are we expecting our pastors or whoever is in charge of the church to do it all? So as we come to a close today, let us remember that a spiritual gift is a God-given gift. A very precious blessing to all of us. Grab it. Use it. And when we start using it, let's edify and unify the body. Let's start becoming the the church that God desires us to be. Let's use our spiritual gifts. Let's stop looking like this guy with no arms or legs or hands. Let's use our spiritual gifts. Come together as one body. Build the church up with our spiritual gifts. And as we leave this building tonight, I want you guys to be encouraged as we go our separate ways to start being the members of the body that God desires us to be. Let us start being the members of the church that unify and build up this church. Let's come together, use our spiritual gifts, edify one another, and start becoming the authentic church. Because remember, if we are not all using our spiritual gifts, we are not being the authentic church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we could dig into your word. And Lord, I thank you for the many lessons you have shown me and taught me. And God, I pray as I preach this message, Lord, I pray that you were able to encourage and and challenge and, and, and give a lesson to others. I thank you that you, this is all your word. And Lord, I pray that as we go our separate ways, we will start being the authentic church. Lord, we, we are so grateful for the spiritual gifts that you have given us. We are so grateful for the blessing of being able to have a spiritual gift that is going to edify and unify your body. So Lord, I, I pray that you encourage us to use that gift that you have given us. I pray you direct us to where and how you want us to use that gift. So, yeah, Lord, I pray that you continue to be at the center of our lives. And, Lord, you shape and you mold us into the church you want us to be. In your precious name. Amen.